Hi, good evening everyone. I've asked Matt to dim the lights on his way out because this evening is going to be... No. <laughs> Let's pretend we're outside, right? So we're going to be observing, but observing with a difference. We're going to be observing with the James Webb Space Telescope. And this is the latest and greatest of the telescopes. This was launched on Christmas Day last year. They only started to make some of the data, the first images public in July. So I'm going to summarize some of the most recent pictures and what it's telling us. First of all, about what the telescope can do in terms of what the pictures look like, how they're an improvement on previous telescopes, but also the kind of science it's going to be attacking. So in particular, James Webb Space Telescope tell, will allow us to see objects that are either too, well, they're too faint, either because they're too far away or they're completely obscured. So for that reason, it's tackling parts of the universe we don't know much about. The very early universe, the first stars, the first galaxies, and then parts of the nearby universe that are heavily obscured, then shrouded by clouds of gas and dust. So why is it better? Well, let's compare it, say, to the previous space telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched back in 1990 and sort of set the standard. Now, it had beautiful clear images because it was out in space. When you're out in space, you don't have any of the blurring effects of the atmosphere and you get the sharpest images that that size telescope can produce. Now, the thing about the Hubble is that its, me its mirror it was 2.4 metres across. The James Webb Space Telescope, it's loaded hexagonal segments stuck together to make a mirror that's approximately eight and a half metres across. Now, telescope duct is like buckets. So in other words, the wider the mirror, the more photons you can collect and the fainter you can see. So, for example, the difference in size between the Hubble and the James Webb means that you can see things that are like a, about 100 times fainter. The bigger mirror also means it's giving you sharper pictures than the Hubble is by about the factor of 10. And to demonstrate this, just show you first look. Here's a picture from Hubble. Whole load is a cluster of galaxies, loads of galaxies in the distance. And this is the same picture with James Webb. Ha <laughs> that's what I like. Well, lots of those noises this evening. And for example, if we zoom in on this little region, let's look at Hubble image, James Webb image. So immediately I think I've sold you about the clarity and the sensitivity. So not only are we seeing existing objects we know about in much more detail, we're also seeing new objects that we couldn't detect before. So not only is it better sensitivity, um, clearer details, but the other thing about the James Webb web is that it works exclusively in the infrared. Now, just a little primer for anybody who's not happy about different light bands, and this is going to be a brighter image, so you'll be dazzled for a minute. Here's your light, all the available light. The thing that is different between different colours of light is the wavelength. So if you have a light wave, it's the distance from one peak to the other. When you've got very energetic light, you have very short wavelengths and you know, less down to less than the size of an atom. And wavelengths can go up to hundreds, thousands of kilometer long. Now in terms of the visible light you're using with your eyes, the wavelengths vary only from one forty thousandth of a milli milli millimeter in blue up to one sixty thousandth of a millimeter in red. Tiny, tiny little band. Now James Webb works beyond the red and it works in the infrared, which is an enormous range of colors. And this is ideal for cooler stuff, that, um, things that aren't hot enough to radiate and visible, but are perhaps cooler or are obscured. And the other thing is that you have many more colours in the infrared than you have in the visible. And James Webb is working primarily in the near infrared, which is just beyond the visible red, and then further on down to the middle infrared. So what is that, how does that help us? Well, it's got two main cameras. One is the near infrared, which as I said, was just beyond the red. And that's the way you get in the very clearest images. 
and this is where you were seeing, seeing cooler objects, so like cool dim stars. You're also showing um, the gas and the dust. You can look through the dust. Uh, if you have a longer wavelength, you can sort of leapfrog over the dust particles and uh, that normally obscure visible light. So it's allowing you to see further into clouds that you can't see into invisible light. And then there's the mid-infrared imager, which goes a bit further. And here, st hot stars are no longer dominant. You're looking at things like planets around stars, exoplanets. You're looking at the dust clouds and how they're warmed by the star stars they contain. And looking at the cooler components of the nearby universe. And also I put here protoplanetary disks. This is star formation, uh, this is solar systems in formation. So those are all kind of things that are going on in the nearby universe. But the other key thing about the infrared is that you can see highly redshifted galaxies. Redshifted galaxies are ones that are moving away from us very fast. And they're moving away from us very fast because they're right at the outer edges of the universe. So, for example, if I show you some of the pictures of the tiny galaxies that Hubble sees that are the most distant, the thing you will notice is that they're all very red. So imagine something now that is redshifted even more, that the starlight is no longer just in the red, but it moves off into the infrared. So the idea is we'll start being able to pick up even further redshifted galaxies by looking exclusively in the infrared. Hubble allowed us to see back to an universe was about, say, about 450 million years old. You are here, big bangs over here by the window somewhere. Diagram not to scale. The Earth's not really that big. That's how far Hubble got us back. And the thing we were still seeing is that these were all galaxies still. They still look like galaxies. The furthest we went, they still look like galaxies. The point about with the, going to the infrared of the James Webb is you can go back further perhaps down to about 200 million years after the Big Bang. And this is crucial because it's in this range that we think the first galaxies are forming. It's about here that we think the first stars are forming. So we're unlocking the furthest regions of the universe. OK, enough of the prep. Let's talk about some actual data. Now, I'm going to start off with Hubble images. Well, actually, I'm going to start off with the ground-based image here. And you look into nearby nebula, there's a cluster of stars here that is pushing out lots of hot um, ultraviolet radiation, lots of winds that are carving and eroding the gas and dust clouds around them. And you can see this like, we liken it to a cliff, but it's like an edge of the dust cloud that's getting eaten into by all this ultraviolet radiation and winds and energetic winds. So think of this as like a big bubble with a star cluster in the middle. If we zoom in just on the edge of this cliff, maybe down here, when you look at it in Hubble, you get this kind of detail, which is already a fantastic improvement from ground. But now, if we go through to the James Webb in the near infrared, so just beyond the visible red, we're going to get that kind of level of detail. And I think this one's out beyond where you'd be getting your coffee at, uh, after my talk. And you can immediately see there's a lot more detail, a lot more stars, and you can see further into the clouds. We can see the structures. We can see how the starlight is eroding the clouds of gas and dust. There are these pillar structures, which all point to where the star cluster was, way up above the ceiling. And if we zoom in on some of those in detail, you can see that these pillars are all, that you have like a dense knot of material that's, protecting the stuff underneath from the erosion from the starlight. And so you build up a pillar there. There's another one here. You see these all over nebulae. Now, we've seen those with the Hubble Space Telescope. But here, when we look in the infrared, we're seeing further into the clouds. So in this image, you can see a strange thing here. It's like a bow shock. It's from a young star. And one of the key things about young stars when they're in their first sort of million years of life is they produce jets that plow out into the interstellar medium around them, collide with the gas and dust and produce this kind of bow shock. A bit like the shock you see in front of a, a boat or a ship when it's moving through the sea. It's just pushing stuff 
out of the way. So signatures like that are a key indication of young stars that have very recently formed. And we can't usually see these because it's happening inside the cloud. That's where the gas is densest and coldest and where it's most likely to collapse under gravity to form new stars. There's another section of them here. Again, you see these sort of bow shocks. So we're beginning to pinpoint where the younger stars are forming within the clouds. Why do they form there? What are the properties of the dust clouds around there? How are they affecting the surrounding material? Uh, this is all near infrared. If we move to the further infrared, now if we go further to the infrared, we call this the mid infrared, remember, you're seeing the radiation from the dust clouds itself. So that then goes to here again. You can see these structures where the dust is being pushed out of the way and you see more stars hidden, buried within the clouds. Okay, so there are lots of these nebulae that have been studied. This is a ground-based picture of what's known as the Tarantula Nebula. It's about 200,000 light years away from a small satellite galaxy to the Milky Way. There's a big star cluster there again. It's sort of blown a cavity around it. Zoom in to the centre. This is what it looks like with NERCAM with James Webb. Again, fantastic detail. All the hot young blue stars are easy to see. They're the ones you see in the visible. But additionally, you see lots of red stars. These are the ones that are reddened because they're buried inside the dust. We're only seeing the red light that escapes through the dust towards us. So all these scattered red dots are thousands of new stars that are still embedded in the clouds and are creating bubbles and cavities deep within them. And the different colours represent different colours of infrared light and where the gas clouds are redder, that's where you're sort of getting much more rich, uh, complex hydrocarbons within the gas. So again, you're looking at the chemistry of the gas and the dust mix that these stars are forming from. And here, for example, is one of these bubbles that's within the clouds and you can see the young stars very clearly and the effect they're having on the structure around them. That's the near infrared. If we move to the mid infrared, we'll see the structure of the dust clouds themselves. Again, different colours represent different temperatures of the dust. This is the cooler, denser dust in the blue grey and the warmer dust is in the red. But you can see structures. So, for example, we go here, look at this object. If we move to the infrared, you can see it's a very bright star buried within the clouds, perhaps with a protoplanetary disk around it. And in fact, all over, there are bright young stars that are forming deep within these clouds that we only see through the infrared. They don't shine strongly in the visible, they only come out in the infrared. Now, one of the most famous nebulae that the Hubble looked at was the so-called Pillars of Creation. To remind you, this is the fantastic Hubble image and everybody's very happy with that. So these big columns of cloud and dust, again, they're being eroded by a big star cluster, which is over above the ceiling in the distance. You're looking at those pillars where stuff around dense knots has been eroded away, stuff behind them has been protected. Now, if we move from the Hubble to the James Webb, it's beautiful. You've got yellow and blue stars, which are the fully formed, the, the age, the proper stars that have been puttering along for a while. But within the clouds, you see many more of these red dots, which are stars forming within the clouds. And there are places where it's almost like these pillars are glowing. It looks like lava. They're glowing red. So, for example, up here and up here, I'll look at them in more detail. And that's because young stars are inside them and they're exciting hydrogen molecules. They're putting out so much heat, they're exciting the environments deep within the cloud to cause them to glow. So, first of all, there are dark regions. There are blobs within the nebula. These are where you have dense blobs, for example, where the light fluffy gas is eroded around them, just leaving the densest knots. Now, these are easily beyond the size of our solar system. The whole of one of these pillars is about 10 light years. And these are little clumps left out in space, but probably within those, 
that's where you're going to get new stars forming. And that dust and gas cloud cocooning them is probably going to go and form, on, form solar systems or planetary systems around those young stars. We've seen the pillars, again, it's the erosion, the effect of the stars on the surrounding dust and gas. And then, as I said, within the ends of these pillars, we've got regions within them. We can now see there are young stars just waiting to break out and escape from the dusting cloud and be released. Well, they're not physically moving, but they're blowing away their environments until they're left isolated in space. And most of these are only about 100,000 years old, we estimate. These are rich, which sounds old, but that's really young for a star. So that's what's going on in the near infrared. If we move to the mid infrared, remember this is where we see the structure of the dust itself. The stars are less relevant. The stars are mostly going to disappear, except where perhaps they're beginning to escape. At the, yeah, oh, this is good. Keep this up. This, <laughs> I like this. Um, you can see where they're just escape. These they're just beginning to break through. And again, the grey. Blue indicates the denser parts of the dust and gas and the hotter dust and more diffuse dust is out there. So we're beginning to see properties of this dust. We're looking at its distribution. Obviously, we don't just have images through telescopes. We get spectra so we can analyze what's in the dust. And these are the ingredients of star formation and solar systems. So this is going to tell us very much about what goes into forming planetary systems. Analyzing the contents of this dust will tell us a lot about star and planetary formation. Now, obviously, all of this is happening in very obscured regions, you know, large regions that are very obscured. Even when you look at an individual star that has just formed, it is still cocooned by a mass of gas and dust. Because remember, stars formed by gravity. Gravity collapses in towards the center. And so it, as it falls in, it heats up the core of the cloud. That's where you get your protostar forming. But there's still matter falling onto this protostar. So for the first few hundred thousand years of its life, it is actually cocooned within this cloud. And there's a very beautiful example, and this is hot off the press. They only released it this afternoon. So if you've been on the BBC website, you might have seen this one already. But if you haven't, this will be new. Uh, there you go. It looks like it ought to be a painting, but this is a real image. So right at the center there, there is a star, a very, very young star. Again, as I say, about 100,000 years old. So it's not really a star yet. It's a pre-star, a protostar. It's still accumulating matter. If you look closely in a bloke right at the center, you can't see the star because it is obscured by dusty disk around it. So that's blocking the light from the star from our line of sight. Inside there is this young star. And the thing about young stars, they're fairly unstable. They give off lots of radiation, lots of heat. And indeed, you can see with this star how it's blasting out and it's lighting up material to, uh, to if the, the disk is flat and then out of the poles, the poles from the disk, you have jets, you have radiation. You have physical winds of matter that come out. And what you're seeing here with these two kind of cones is where these winds are blowing in and interacting with the surrounding material. And in fact, look at within these clouds, you have these beautiful filamentary features. And these are filaments of molecular hydrogen, which is being excited to glow by the interaction between what's coming out from the star to the to the top and bottom of it. Now, this shows us the very early stages of star formation, which are comparatively brief in a star's life. So they're quite difficult to find. It's relatively transient. So actually looking at it in detail, telling us more that we can compare to our models of how stars form and what early stars look like. But it's also telling us about this disk around the star, which will most likely go on and form a solar system later. So there's lots of things you can see about young stars forming, protostars, the disks around their stars. James Webb is also telling us about the death of stars. Because this dust material that's out in the gas clouds, a lot of it comes from very old stars at their end of their life. And they become red giants. They've got cool, puffy atmospheres. 
It is deep within there that you form all these particles of dust. And by dust, I mean so tiny grains, about the size of you know, um, particles in cigarette smoke, for example, which are carbonates and silicates. And they're formed a lot of them in the outer atmospheres of stars. And when these stars reach the end of their lives, they puff off these outer layers, which gradually disperse out into the environments, ready for a next generation of stars. But we can catch the, that action. So here is a dying star. It's about 2,500 light years away. This bubble is about uh, half a light year across. Think of this as like a, a, a shell of material that this star has expelled. And it's a binary system, and it's one of the, I think it's the dimmer star in the middle there. OK, you can tell that, I mean, obviously, there's excited gas that's glowing different colours. You can tell from the dark marks there's dust there. If you move to James Webb and then in infrared, you begin to see some of that really complex behaviour. And you can see that there, it's given off the dust in perhaps episodes. You can sort of perhaps see it sort of burped out different shells of material that expand out, almost like sort of onion rings. This is a beautiful image of a dying star, what it's contributing to its environment. What I like is when you, I mean, you don't see it in this image, but in this image, look in the background. You get little background galaxies that you see through this nebula, this added extra bonus. And then if you move to the mid infrared, you're looking at the dust that itself. So you can get, again, the characteristics of the dust. The other thing I mentioned about the mid infrared is it's very suitable for finding planets. Now, they're studying planets around other stars. They're not the best pictures, so I haven't included them, but there's plenty online and I'll give you an address to look things up. Oh, my battery's running low. That's a bit worrying. It helps if you turn the plug on. There we are. Try that. There we are. Now, this is an artist's impression. This is not a James Webb picture, but it's of a planet we know about. It's about half the mass of Jupiter. It's about the same, it's slightly bigger than the diameter of Jupiter, and it's about a thousand light years away. But this planet orbits incredibly close to its host star, only about a ninth of the distance that Mercury orbits around our sun, which means it goes around its star every three and a half Earth days. That means it's very hot because it's close to the sun, about 500 degrees, and so it's got a very extended puffy atmosphere. Now, this is great because the other thing about it is as it orbits its sun, it moves in front of the star, and that allows us to analyse its atmosphere. So, for example, when this is the light from the star, and when the planet moves in front of the star, it just dims the starlight. Now, full zero. Okay, by tiny, tiny, less than one and a half percent of the total starlight, it dips a bit. So when it eclipses, the um, star moves in front of it. Now, what you can do is that you can capture the light from the star when the planet's behind or not in front of it and compare it to the light from the star when you've got the planet in front of it. And what this gives you, you're, you're comparing the unfiltered light from the star to the light when it's been filtered through the atmosphere, that extended puffy atmosphere of the planet. And by doing that, you can look for signatures of chemicals within the planet's atmosphere. Now, we've done this with Hubble, but we can do it so much better with James Webb. So they've only released this one exoplanet so far. And this, again, is to show you we don't just work in images. These are spectra. When you're looking at a whole range of different infrared colours, you're looking for chemical signatures and molecules. So this is the first exoplanet where we've detected carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. We detect water vapour in its atmosphere. And by looking at the shape of these structures, they can tell whether it's steam, how high it is in the atmosphere. We're beginning to look at the, we the weather conditions on pl other planets around other stars. And James Webb is going to be doing this for a whole variety of planets, not just these big, puffy, easy to spot Jupiters, but ideally one day planets a bit more like our Earth. Maybe we'll begin to get to see signatures of their atmosphere. So this is just the start of the exoplanet research. So I've covered sort of star formation, protoplanetary disks, nebulae, dust. We've looked at dying stars. Well, let's move a bit further out. Let's look at galaxies. Here, for example, is a, it's called Stefan's Quintent. It's a group of five galaxies. This one is in the foreground. 
So imagine that's here and the others are way further back. But the other four galaxies are all kind of interacting, uh, responding to each other's gravity. And you can see in particular, these two look a bit strange. They've sort of cut, they're sort of colliding or interacting or getting close to each other that they're getting distorted. And it's clearly producing new clouds of gas and star formation. That's the Hubble image. If we move to the JWST just beyond the visible, you can see what we call tidal tails, where material is being dragged out of the galaxy by the gravity of the other, um, other galaxies. It's sort of shearing effect that um, you get that these distortions. And in particular, well, I'll just show you, you can also look at the dust. You can look at the dust in distant galaxies, not just our own galaxy. So you can compare dust properties of other galaxies and see how much like it's that in the Milky Way. But anyway, going back to the interaction of these, if I zoom in on some of these regions, you can see where there is gas that's been pulled out by gravity or as the galaxies pass each other. If we look in there, young clusters of stars forming out of a galaxy, out in the middle of space, just collapsing down from this cold gas that's been poured out of their host galaxy. So we're looking at the star formation, gas and dust going on in these tidal tails. And the other nice, and over here, way out, I mean, look how far that is from the galaxies, but just there, you've got a knot of new stars forming. Large star clusters, maybe even dwarf galaxies that are being formed. And this is a key part of how galaxies merge, how galaxies change with time, is through gravitational interactions. Okay, so the, what you can see in this image is the wallpaper. Ignore the galaxies in the front and look at all the dots in the background and they're all galaxies. Well, apart from the ones with spikes, they're the stars, okay? So that's a star, 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 rest of galaxies. So if we look in detail here, we begin to see what I was talking about, these very distant galaxies. And the deeper you look, the fainter you get, the further the objects are. So this is my last image. Well, this is my last image, but it's the last thing I'm going to talk about. I showed you this cluster of galaxies is a long way away. It's about 4.6 thousand million light years away. It's a big cluster of galaxies all held together under gravity. This is the Hubble image. Now look at it in the near infrared with James, with James Webb. Okay, you get not just the clarity, but look at how many more objects we're seeing. The reason they target a cluster of galaxies is you will also see that many of these objects are smeared out into arcs. That because the gravity of a cluster of galaxies can act to magnify and focus the light from dis, you know, galaxies that are even further away. So this cluster of galaxies in the four, well, relative foreground, I wouldn't call 4.6 thousand million light years away, particularly foreground, but it's relatively near. And the galaxies further back have their light magnified and brought to a focus through this. So we get to see more distant galaxies if we peer through the galaxy, through a cluster. And there, some of these are very distorted because it doesn't bring it to a nice, neat focus. It's a bit like looking through the bottom of a glass tumbler. Everything is smeared and distorted. But for example, these two are two images, two reflected magnified images of a distant galaxy. If we look in detail with James Webb, can you see they're the same galaxy? They're inverted, so you've got a little blue patch and a star, a little blue patch and a star, center, center, something going on there, something going on there. And many of these images within this cluster background are being magnified and brought even brighter because the cluster's in the foreground. So this is how we get to see the even further galaxies than we saw with Hubble. And there's so much more detail available in James Webb. For example, this little cluster down, I mean, you can see all kinds of beautiful spirals, structures, but this, look at this group down here. 
That's not unlike the little group of galaxies I showed you before, showing you how galaxies change and evolve through the history of the universe. And as we track them further back in time, we'll perhaps be able to wind back to see how galaxies form and evolve. And the very reddest objects within this image are the most distant objects because they are the most redshifted. These are the ones you don't see in Hubble because their light has been shifted out of the visible and into the infrared. And it's early days yet and astronomers are arguing about which is the most distant galaxy and is it really a distant galaxy, blah, 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 as we like to do. It's great fun. But within this image, for example, there are some that have been identified as back to, say, 13.1 billion years ago. We think the universe is only about 13.8 billion years, so this is getting pretty good. And these are the most distant galaxies so far. And I do want to stress, I'm showing you images. Remember, we also get spectra. Spectra is when you look at, you look at much sort of finer, uh, you, you kind of shift all the light from the infrared and spread it out and you look at where you've got bright light. So for example, you don't just have an image and the color, but you have the spectrum, say if this furthest galaxy here, it's showing features which have all been shifted to the red of gas clouds that are excited. So we have other, it's not just colors and the, pic and the image, but we have spectral evidence that these are very distant objects. There's a fanfare because it's so exciting, that's great. So hopefully you can begin to see that we're going to learn incredible amounts about galaxies that existed all across cosmic time. You know, in terms of the very distant ones, and we can compare them to what we see going on within our own galaxy and within galaxies in our relatively nearby universe. Now, I've only skimmed the surface of everything, but hopefully this has whetted your appetite. If you want to find out more, if you want to revisit these pictures, and see a few that I didn't have time to include this evening, basically go to webtelescope.org. And every time there's an image that's made um, public, you can access it, you can download ridiculously high resolution images and go looking, at your, looking for yourself at all these fantastic distant galaxies and new findings that we're going to be making all across the cosmos. So I hope you get the sense it's going to be a really, really exciting time. Thank you. So the question is, out of all the other galaxies we've looked at, is there yet any other sign of life that we've made? And I would say not yet, unless there's a really big secret they're keeping from everyone. <laughs> if there is a sign of life, you won't want to argue how are we going to know about it. And maybe one of the ways is when you look at the chemicals within the atmospheres of planets around other stars. Scientists argue about what would be a signature of biological life rather than geological activity or weather activity on a planet. But it's quite likely that maybe among some of these planets, we might begin to see things that we think are biosignatures within the atmosphere. So we haven't found it yet, but I would say we're getting closer. And I hope you can appreciate there are so many galaxies and so many planets and so many stars out there. There's probably other life out there too. Yeah, in front. Does every galaxy have a planet? Well, a typical galaxy has about 100,000 million stars in, and we reckon over half of those have at least one planet around them. So every galaxy has masses of planets, millions of planets. There's no shortage of planets out there. Yes? Can you just say a bit louder? Why do stars die? Well, they run out of fuel. A star is only a star for as long as it can hold itself up against gravity. Gravity wants to pull it inwards. And the only way it can resist that is if it's burning hydrogen to the helium in the core. 
And if it does that, it produces an outward pressure that stops the collapse of gravity. Now, at some point, it's going to run out of, heat, of fuel in the centre of the star, so it's fuel that's hot enough to burn. And I say burn, it's all nuclear reactions, but you get the idea. It produces heat and pressure. When it runs out, can't, it can't keep up against gravity, and that's when gravity squashes it down into neutron star, white dwarf, black hole, something like that. So they died because they run out of fuel. We okay uh, to keep the questions at the back? Should we, yeah, should we do the two questions here and then uh, maybe anyone that wants to ask uh, Carolyn some more questions can stay around while everyone else goes for a cup of tea. Uh, so do you just do two questions at the back? You first, maybe? Can stars form into one big star? Do you mean if they get very close together, might they merge together? You would think so, because I'm showing you big clusters of stars, you know, where there are thousands and millions of them all crammed together. But in practice, the space between stars is much bigger than the size of the stars, so they don't collide and, and sort of merge together very often. So in practice, it can happen, but it's incredibly rare. And usually, it's, if stars were part, part of a binary system, which means they spend their life going, they'll form together, and they spend their life going around. Maybe that final stage, where they throw off the outer layers, maybe one goes supernova, turns them into a black hole or a neutron star, they might eventually spiral together and merge. But we don't think that happens very, very often. So it can happen, very, very rare. Okay, and uh, last question, right to the back. Okay, you so the question is, if a star near to the Earth turns into a black hole, will the Earth get sucked into it? No. You have to get very, very close to a black hole before you're in danger of getting sucked onto it. And, and I will say, this may sound strange, but if the sun at the centre of our solar system turned to a black hole, it wouldn't be a very big black hole, but if it turned, you know, may, it, it would still sit there at the centre of the solar system, we would still feel the same gravity and we would still orbit it. We would be safe. You've got to get incredibly close to a black hole before you get into danger. We'd, it would not be nice for lots of other reasons because black holes have lots of energetic radiation. So we would, it would not be good for the Earth, but it not because we got sucked onto the black hole. Wonderful. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take 10 minutes to have a cup of tea. Uh, before we be back for the next talk, before that, can we thank Aaron again? Thank you. If you want to come here about to get more, probably, do you want me to get you a cup of tea?